Bible, if you take the word of God, please, and turn with me in the New Testament to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. As always, I'd like for you to keep your Bible open to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and the passage we're using and mark some amazing things we find in this passage. If you have your Bible open to this 10th chapter, we begin with one verse. It is the 11th verse. Let such and one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. May I read it again as you follow along. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I'd like you to mark this expression. Such as we are in word, and then will we be also in deed. Such as we are in word, will we be also in deed. And I'm speaking on this subject. We are who we say we are. We are who we say we are. Paul made a declaration. He was under attack. We've been cast into a conflict, all of us who are believers and know the Lord. The Lord Jesus warned us of this. He said, in the world you'll have tribulation. And in particular, with these folks in Corinth, Paul was put under much scrutiny. And they said, you know, you write strong things, you declare these strong things, but then they tell him in the 10th verse, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. When people see you, you're weak, and your speaking, your speech is contemptible. You write these strong things about God and God's word. And so as he knows he's under this conflict and under this attack, his apostleship is being questioned. May I say his Christian faith is being questioned. Are you who you claim to be? Are you who you say you are? And he writes to them in these plain words saying, we are who we say we are. Who we are in word is exactly who we are in deed. There's no hypocrisy. There's no space between our word and deed. There's no sham. I remember talking to a man about his soul, he was a butcher in a grocery store and I said, there's a man here in your store who's a Christian who works with you, I know, who's made requests for your salvation and would like to see you come to know Christ as your savior. Whether this is true or not, the butcher said to me, what he is in church is not what he is in this grocery store. I had to leave it that that's been long ago. But I thought if that's true, then how will this man ever come to Christ? How will he ever come to Christ if someone is claiming to be a dedicated Christian and concerned for others and is not living it in the public place where he works? Are we, you and I, are we who we say we are? Are we? Hypocrisy means we're wearing a mask. If a person is a hypocrite, it comes from the theater, the word from the theater where people played a part and wore a mask and they pretended to be the person behind the mask and that word came out of that theater, 
that, that's hypocrisy. That's not really who they are. They're wearing a mask and they're pretending to be someone they're not. The Lord Jesus used this word. We've heard this word as Christians all our Christian lives, that there are some people who are hypocrites. They're not who they appear to be. And I'm asking the question again of myself and of everyone who's listening. Are we who we say we are? Are we? You may say I'm a Christian and you may not be a very good Christian. You may even add to the sentence I'm a Christian but I'm not a very good Christian. But I'm gonna tell you, when you say you're a Christian, when you say you're a Christian, there are things people expect of you as a Christian. You may not be a very good Christian, but when you say you're a Christian, there are expectations placed upon you because you're identifying with Jesus Christ. And Paul declares to these Corinthians, we are who we say we are. And I want us to look at the passage here and allow God to work in our hearts to help us. And I want you to write these things down, would you please? I want you to have the expectation that when I'm finished, you start. When you've heard me say what I'm going to say, it's your turn to speak and say what you've heard to someone else. I may just call on you to turn to the person sitting beside you and say the very same things I've said and see if you've been listening. Because as I've said so many times, ministers of the gospel should not preach to be heard, they should preach to be repeated. Do you get it? Do you receive it? If it's God's word, do you believe it? Is it true? Has God dealt with you? Number one, we are who we say we are because we have received the unspeakable gift of salvation. Look at the closing verse in the ninth chapter, if you would please. The unspeakable gift. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Now, if you read through the ninth chapter of this book of 2 Corinthians, you're gonna find a great discussion about giving and sowing and reaping. Look at verses six and following. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all things, all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now God says in this discussion Paul is having through his pen to these Corinthians that you understand whatever you give, you're gonna receive. You are Giving, if you give bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. We reap what we sow. And then God is able to use what he has in his bountiful flow to give you all you need. And the, the discussion of giving seems to climax in this last verse. It says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Have you received God's unspeakable gift? Quote this verse with me, would you please? If you know it, would you quote it with me aloud? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's try it together again, would you please? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his son. The Bible goes on to say, if God has given us his son, he also will freely give us all things. There's no reason to ever doubt there's anything that you need God won't provide. And the proof of that is you need salvation, I need salvation, we need our sins forgiven. There's nothing we can do to forgive our own sin. We owe a sin debt, it has to be paid. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. All of us have a death sentence, a death sentence hanging over us. It's for death. It's a death sentence hanging over us. We've been sentenced to death. The wage of sin is death. 
It has to be paid. We can't pay it. No matter how hard we try, we can't pay it. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You may talk about the cross of Christ and what he did. You may celebrate it and sing about it, but do you know why he died? He died for you. And he died for me. The Bible says he became sin for us. That means when he hung on the cross, the sin of the whole world was laid upon him. The Old Testament said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our iniquity was laid on him and when our iniquity was laid on him, your sins and mine were laid on him, then the billows of God's wrath struck the Son of God and punished him for all our sin. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was forsaken of God because he became sin for us. And the sin debt was paid. That's God's gift. God's gift to us is his son. Our gift to God is to give him our lives because he gave his gift to us. Who are we? Who are we? You say, I may be a good neighbor or I may be a good worker. Or I may be the best worker on the job. That's wonderful. I may be a good friend, but if you're a Christian, you are someone who has received God's unspeakable gift. You've been born again. You may be a church member and not receive that. You may be aligned with some religion and not receive that. But who you are, if you really are a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have received God's unspeakable gift. Have you received it? Have you asked God to forgive your sin and by faith trusted the Lord Jesus as your personal savior? You know, amazingly, there's so much talk about religion and so much talk about God and so much talk about even salvation, but so little understanding of being born again. So little understanding. That's pointed out for us in John chapter three when the man came, very religious man, very religious man, a ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus under the cover of darkness and Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. And the man said, what do you mean? Do I go back in my mother's womb and come out again? And the Lord went on to explain to him that there's a physical birth and there's a spiritual birth. Have you had a spiritual birth? It's supernatural. It's something you can't do for yourself. You can't just decide for yourself. It's an experience you have with God when you ask God to forgive your sin, accept God's payment for your sin, that Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead, and you receive the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. That's receiving God's unspeakable gift. Have you received God's unspeakable gift? Have you received it? If we are who we say we are as Christians, we are people who've received God's unspeakable gift. Now let's move aside for a moment the chapter and verse divisions and go right in to the 10th chapter from the 9th chapter. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I want you to write a second thing down, if you would please. We have learned of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. We have learned of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Listen carefully, please. I want you to get this. We have learned of the gentleness and meekness of Christ. What image do you have of Christ? Did he come to you with a big hammer? That's what people think. A club in his hand? Is he chasing you around to send you off to hell? Is he some sort of monster to you? Is he? You see, the world tries to confuse what everyone believes about Christ and knows about Christ. There's nothing Satan wants more than to twist and corrupt 
the truth about Jesus Christ. Think of him. Think of him. He humbled himself and became a man. How did he become a man? Did he just pop up on the earth one day? The most robust of men? No, he humbled himself and became a baby. A big baby. Put your phone up, son, and listen. You came here to listen. You ready for that? Thank you. Did he just pop up on earth and move around among men, some robust giant of a man? No, the Lord Jesus came as a baby. He humbled himself to the extent that he was held. God, the creator God, became a man and was born as a baby and held in the arms of Mary. He lived a sinless life. He never sinned. He owed no sin debt. He went to the cross, and he went to the cross. He wasn't crucified like other people. The Romans crucified thousands of people, thousands of people. It was their way of terrorizing people to get them into shape and cause them to live in such fear that Rome could dominate them. And they always crucified people in a public place. So, so when you came by, you saw them and you looked at the agony of the person hanging on the cross. You assume they were great criminals or had done something so terribly wrong because they're suffering the most horrific death, the most horrendous dying. It went on for hours and hours and hours and perhaps even some days, gasping for breath, crying out for mercy, screaming at the top of their lungs. And people would look at that, have to stare at it because they put them on passageways and roads and public places. So you knew you better not mess with Rome. Now I want you to know that Jesus Christ gave himself to be crucified, to be nailed on a cross, to be spat upon, to be beaten, bruised, have his beard torn out, lacerated with whips and cats of nine tails a name for a whip with bone or metal in it that would tear your flesh open. But that's not the worst suffering. The suffering that is greatest suffering of all suffering is to be separated from God. And that's what every person will suffer who dies without Christ and goes to hell forever. A man in hell gave a testimony and he said, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he cried out and said, have mercy on me and Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. That's what the man in hell said. And any person who dies without Christ is going straight to hell. But Jesus suffered our hell for us. He suffered our hell for us, our payment for us. He took the sins of the vilest human beings who've ever lived. Some of those accounts we've read about. Things that you don't even talk about in a mixed audience what they should be punished. He took all of that on himself. This is God who could have called 10,000 angels and destroyed the world, but he bled and died for us. He suffered for us. And by his own power, he rose from the grave, alive evermore, conquered death, held in the grave, defeated the devil. He didn't have to die. He didn't have to stay on the cross. People cried to him, come down from the cross if thou be the son of God, but he stayed on the cross because he truly was the son of God. Because he's the only one who could pay our debt. And he did. The Bible says he humbled himself and became a man. Not just a man, but a servant. And not just a servant, but an obedient servant. And not just obedient to some things. Obedient unto death. And the Bible says there's one person who was crucified who is the Son of God, that someday every knee of every human being who's ever lived in any age, at any time, will bow. Every person listening to the sound of my voice, this moment, every person in this room will bow their knees and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But the 
Bible says he's gentle. The gentleness of Jesus. Who are we? We are people who have learned that we, hell-deserving sinners, could come to the gentle Jesus Christ for salvation. That no matter who we were or what we've done, he would receive us. Think of that. There are people I don't enjoy being around. Some of them have terrible odor. Some have such wicked ways, it's changed their appearance. Some people are frightening. You look at them and you're frightened by them. They're human beings, but you're frightened by them. Now remember, I grew up in a bar. My father was an operator of a bar, a beer joint. I grew up there. I spent nights there. I saw the worst of human behavior. I've seen people nearly beaten to death with a pool stick with a rubber hose on it and get beaten. I've seen people carry on like animals and you wanted to hide from them, close doors and get in a locked place so they couldn't get to you. But there's not one person who's ever lived on this earth who came to Jesus repenting of their sin that he didn't receive them into his arms and love them. And so Paul writes here, we have learned the gentleness of Jesus Christ. I want you to hold your place just for a moment. I think this is deserving of more emphasis. And I want you to turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Psalms just for a moment. In the 18th chapter of the Psalms, the word of God tells us, in Psalm 18 and verse 35, I want you to see this. Psalmist writes, thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy right hand hath holden me up. And notice this last expression, thy gentleness hath made me great. Thy gentleness, he's speaking to God, thy gentleness hath made me great. We think our greatest moments when we overpower someone. We think our greatest moment is when we get people to do what we want them to do. We live by force. It's the law of the jungle. I'm telling you, our greatest moment is when we humble ourselves as God the Son did and lift up the fallen and care for the dying. That's our greatest moment. And they said, you are not an apostle. You're not a servant of God. You write big strong letters, but when we see you, you're a weak man. And when you open your mouth, your speech is contemptible. Who are you? He said, we are who we say we are. We are people who have received God's unspeakable gift. Christ lives in us. We are people who have learned the gentleness of Jesus Christ. The gentleness of Jesus Christ. Have you and I learned the gentleness of Jesus Christ? I want you to write a third thing down, would you please? We are who we say we are. We, notice the very words of scripture, we do not war after the flesh. That's verse three of chapter 10. We do not war after the flesh. Now we walk in the flesh. We live with the flesh, but we don't war after the flesh. We don't fight our battles like everyone else fights their battles. If they fought their battles like everyone else fought their battles, Paul would say, I'll tell you, when I get, when I get there, I'm gonna straighten you people out. I'm going to straighten you out. Even pastors have times when they say, well, I'm just going to straighten people out. I remember a pastor who came to me and said, I'm going back to my church and we're having a family talk. Brother, they're going to hear from me. And I said, well, what do you hope to happen after they hear from you? And his family, his wife and children were in the room when I was talking with him. I said, I've gotten in the flesh just like that. And I've gone beyond what I should have gone. And 
I've told them off, what's left when you do? Is that the way you treat your family? You say you're going to have a family talk. You want to drive your children away? You want to put a wedge between you and your wife? If you're going to have a family talk, you're going to have a family talk in such a way that when it's all over, you're closer to one another and you love one another and there's no gap between you. You're all together. You're all pulling in the same direction, wanting the same thing. So Paul writes to these people. This is what he says to these people. Now, when we war, we're in battle, we're in the conflict, but we don't, we don't fight like other people fight. Christian people don't fight like that. We do not war after the flesh. Would you listen to what he said? He says, for though, verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's the way, that's the way we do battle. You know, I saw people arguing and fighting today some young visitors in a hallway. I said, stop that. Get in here and listen to the word of God. Let God speak to your heart. And some of you have seen part of me, part of me, you see me as a, a bully, get it done, you know. He's, don't, don't let my, don't, don't let my behavior fool you from my resolve. I don't have to fight with people. My resolve is to get people to Christ and let him change their lives. I can't change their lives. I can talk to them and give them principled things and they can ponder those things and pray, seek God, but I can't change their lives. I want you to hold your place here just a moment because we're all in a fight. We're all in a conflict. And I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Let me just read a few things. Beginning with verse 10. Here's the conflict. Finally, my brethren, Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. That's where our strength has to come. And the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Get in the armor room Make sure you've got all your armor on because you're in the conflict. You're going out in the battle to fight. This is who we are. This is how you examine us. You say, my wife and I don't, don't get along like we should. So you try to overpower? Is that the way you do it? Or she tries to overpower you? She feels like she's been the underdog all her life and she's always, you know, having to get the worst of it and so she's not going to give you an edge and is that the way you do it? Who can talk the other one down, squash them so you can have your way? Is that the way you do it? No, we do not war after the flesh. That's who we are. So, Put on the whole armor of God, verse 11, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Who do you think you're really fighting? The world, flesh, and the devil, not one another. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You say, you should see him. He sure is flesh and blood. You should see her. She's flesh and blood. Are you a believer? Do you know the Lord? Have you received this unspeakable gift, such a gift, words are not worthy of explaining it. You can't muster enough of the English language or any other language to really thoroughly talk about the gift you've received from God. Are you a receiver of the unspeakable gift of salvation? Are you? Have you learned personally of the gentleness of Jesus Christ? If so, then you know the battle is not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And the devil could use lots of things and the world can use lots of things to 
to set you aside, to disturb you. And the Bible says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, to stay with it. Pass the test. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Do you have the truth? And on the breastplate of righteousness, are you been clothed in Christ's righteousness? Are you still fighting your old rags? Are you clothed in the righteousness of Christ? If you've received the unspeakable gift, he has changed you. He has taken your rags, your sin, and he's given you his righteousness. He sees you now as one of his own children. You may feel badly about yourself, but you're foolish when you do. You're a child of God. And God sees you and he says, he says of you that you are precious in his sight. Your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, you have faith in God. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, you've got it. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, you've got it. You're praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication. You've got a direct access to Christ through prayer. Oh, may God help us. So we're not fighting in the weapons of the flesh. The Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, back to verse four of chapter 10, 2 Corinthians. But our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's something that's been long standing, long standing. I mean, this is something I've had to deal with for a long, long time. It's actually a stronghold. Well, God can pull it down. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity. We, we got them. They're in captivity now. The enemy's been conquered and he's held. How's he held? He's been brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought, every thought, every thought has been given to Christ. That's who we are. And let me give you quickly a fourth thing. Not only are we people who have received God's unspeakable gift, we've learned the gentleness of Christ. We do not war after the flesh. We understand this is spiritual warfare, a spiritual warfare. But we seek only God's approval. Is he pleased? Well, I didn't please them, those folks. I didn't please, wait a minute. We seek only God's approval. He closes this chapter we have here in verse 18. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Is God pleased with what you've done? Is he? You're living with one audience. Is the Lord pleased? Have you met his approval? Have you? Have I? I don't want you to have to think about this, but I'm gonna throw it out there. I don't want you to have to think about it. I really don't because it's not the thing that matters most. I don't want you to have to think about it. But do you ever think how many people want me to please them? How many different people want me to meet their approval? You know, in our home, I want to do what Evelyn wants done as much as is possible. We have two sons and two wonderful daughters-in-law and two wonderful sons and six loving, adoring grandchildren who constantly telling me how much they love me and how much I love them. They're sweet, precious kids. And I like to please them. I like to please her. And I really like to make all of you happy. And the other half of the world in this church that's in and out, but <laughs> I, like to, I like to please you. But it all comes down to one thing. We are 
we are these people. We are who we say we are, and who we say we are means that we seek to please the audience of one, to do what God wants, to obey the Lord. Is this what God wants? I say to a couple getting married, are you praying or seeking God? Is this, is this who God wants you to marry? Then I want to help you. Is this who God wants you to marry? Then I want to help you. Is this what God wants you to do? You say you're moving to another state, another city. Is it what God is ordering? Are you just going after a job? You haven't thought about God or a church or anything? Wait a minute, hold it. I'm going to give you some things to think and pray about. Is this what God wants? That's the kind of people we are. We're not like everybody else in the world. There's a lot of good people who do some good things. But who are we? We are children of God who've received the unspeakable gift. We are children of God who have learned of the gentleness of Jesus Christ. He's approachable. Think about that. The eternal God who spoke the world into existence is approachable. And when we get into conflicts, and brother, we get in them, we don't fight them like other people fight them. We fight them with prayer and the word of God and truth, and help and salvation and the peace of God. And I'll tell you something else. When it's all said and done, we just want to say, Lord, are you pleased with what I've done? Do we have your approval? That's who we are. And if that's not who we are, we ought to say, God, forgive me because that's who I ought to be and who I want to be. So we are we pray who we say we are. Let's bow in prayer together, may we?